our next session is flow diverters workshop i request dr manish agrawal dr dr vk dikshit and dr vivek gupta to kindly chair the session please i request to all the speaker please be on stick on the time because we are running so late you didn't say this to the previous speakers <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to apply the rule to me all right it's a great pleasure we to be here you we spare <laughs> you <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here thank you dr gupta for inviting me uh, i have a strong indian connection and i'm proud of it Uh, this is my conflict of interest. This is what's happening in Philadelphia right now. As we speak, the Philadelphia Eagles, the football team, won the Super Bowl in the U.S., so they are world champions. So this is uh, Philadelphia, my city there. And my friends are sending me pictures to uh, tease me about uh, the festivities. Uh, the first time I came to India, I met uh, Mr. Gavaskar. I met... Uh, Uh, your uh, Minister of Finance, I saw uh, Gulshan Grover and uh, JJ Valaya. So each time I come to India, it's uh, very exciting. So uh, um, who are you going to introduce me to this time, Dr. Gupta? <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to start by uh, just, you know, the classical way of uh, treating aneurysms. Uh, coiling aneurysms is a little bit like uh, pushing uh, those passengers in the train. Uh, so we start pushing coils, we push coils, uh, when should we stop and when en enough is enough and uh, then later on the aneurysm may rupture and then you're going to have body parts herniating from the uh, window uh, of the train. But this is practically earlier, the lectures you, you showed, this is what Dr. Gupta was trying to do by pushing those uh, coils. And those men are the balloons, you know. the men that are pushing. So here we're talking about something else. We're talking about flow diversion. It's a different concept. I'm sure you all uh, have seen this movie. This is in vitro. Uh, this is uh, an aneurysm without a flow diversion. We're injecting and uh, this is the coefficient of washout, washout of the contrast from the aneurysm. As you see, it's steep. And this is after we put a flow diverger, uh, diverter Uh, you can see the waving of the contrast and you see that the coefficient of uh, uh, becomes really uh, less steep of washout. So a uh, lot of flow diversion out in the market. Uh, you can pick and choose. Uh, unfortunately, in the U.S., only one is FDA approved, which is the pipeline. Uh, the rest were in a trial and now we're waiting for the approval. I always like to start with uh, my first pipeline case seven years ago. This was a physician at, uh, at my hospital who had this uh, symptomatic cavernous uh, aneurysm. Uh, the procedure went well. As you know, the first five cases you need to be proctored. So I was proctored. Procedure went well, took, uh, was done quickly. Then the proctor uh, told me just keep the patient on heparin drip for 24 hours. The patient was neurointact. Then uh, until the next day, two hours before discharge, I get called because the patient is hemiplegic. And this is what we have. And, uh, you know, initially we thought that uh, pipeline was the panacea, was the treatment for everything and everything uh, w would be good. So, you know, after 500 and plus pipeline, after so many uh, publications uh, uh, on pipeline, I think I, I realized that there are things that we know that we know. Uh, this is uh, obvious. There are things that uh, we know that we don't know. Those are things we need to work uh, on. There are things that we don't know that we know. This is a bonus. We know things that we don't know that we know. But the most dangerous one is the last one, which is there are things we don't know that we don't know. And that's the most dangerous. And this is mainly uh, what we should be uh, focusing on. 
So as you know, the pipeline is practically more, more metal than uh, we've ever put in a vessel. We've never put so, ma so much metal in a vessel. Uh, you know, we used to do in the early 2000s, the stent-assisted coiling. Those stents were 6-7% metal coverage. Here we're talking uh, close to 30% metal coverage. So this, this is a totally different game here. Uh, those are the, uh, the trials, the first four trials that mainly the PUF trial that led to the FDA approval of pipeline. As you see, occlusion rates are unheard of. This, in endovascular, we've never had such an occlusion rate. Uh, and the recurrence rate, as you see, is all you know, uh, zero. Also, it's new in the endovascular world. So uh, pra practically, uh, I, I can show you so many pictures about cases pre before and after. Uh, I'm not really interested in the on-label use of pipeline. We know pipeline works. I'm interested in the frontiers that we crossed and we've, we, we're able to treat more aneurysms that we weren't able to treat before with pipeline. But as I'm going to show you uh, later on that there are a lot of aneurysms where there are, we cannot treat with pipeline, where we fail with pipeline. This is, for example, one of those aneurysms, look, proximal pica. Uh, this was a ruptured uh, aneurysm, and uh, it is controversial to use a flow diverter or a stent in ruptured, but if you follow the protocols and, th and you don't have any other option, you can do it. And in this case, I don't think we had a better option. Uh, if you look here, most likely a dissecting aneurysm, and this is the follow-up, uh, completely reconstructed the pica, despite the fact that it's a small caliber vessel, but was able to, uh, to treat it. This is a six months follow up angiogram showing that the vessel is uh, completely uh, reconstructed. Again, the issue is not where the pipeline works, it's mainly where the pipeline doesn't work and uh, choosing the patient is key. So uh, there are a lot of cases where pipeline uh, most likely won't work. Uh, as you know, as you all know, wall apposition is very important. Branching vessels taking off the neck of the aneurysm, this is what keeps uh, the aneurysm patent. Uh, in general, if the, aneurysm, uh, if the aneurysm is large, you can create enough stasis to occlude the aneurysm and leave a small neck for the perforator, not the perforator, the branching vessel to, to stay patent. But if the aneurysm is slow, this suction of uh, gradient of pressure that this vessel is creating is going to keep on creating the turbulence and the aneurysm will remain patent. Fetal PCA, we published about that. Uh, there are some groups that don't agree with us. Uh, on that and they think that if we wait more year or two the aneurysm will go away mismatch and sizing of the pipeline is important I'm going to show you some cases elongation is very important if you're going to use a pipeline uh, you oversize the pipeline you're going to lose the, if the flow diverter effect previously slant, stented aneurysms and this is going to be the subject of a talk later on that I'm going to give also bifurcating aneurysms Prolonged anticoagulation. This is an issue that we're seeing more and more. Patients on, uh, with AFib on anticoagulation, uh, they have, they are, uh, we're seeing less occlusion. Non-coverage of the neck, late mi migration, and dolicoectatic big giant aneurysm, etc. So, uh, what about side branch uh, and perforator occlusion? Uh, I'm going to go quickly. I see that uh, someone is playing with the clock here, and I think it's going faster than it's supposed to. Uh, <coughs> but anyway, so uh, this is our paper on the fate of the ophthalmic artery that we published in neurosurgery. Uh, and, and we looked at uh, patients where we covered 95 patients were included with a mean angiographic follow-up of 7.5 months. The ophthalmic artery remained patent in 89% of the times. It showed diminished flow in 4% and was occluded in 7%. So only one patient had clinical uh, problem related to the occlusion. So yes, we see occlusion of perforator, but uh, in general non-symptomatic. Uh, what, what we had, with, this was correlated with the size of the aneurysm. So the larger the aneurysm is, the higher chance of occluding the ophthalmic artery. Coverage by more than one device uh, would predict also uh, an occlusion of the ophthalmic artery. Uh, so uh, the rate of occlusion was 8.6 percent when covered by one device and 21 percent when covered by uh, two devices or more. We, th we, th we found also that the age, uh, so older people, 
uh, would have more preserved flow in their ophthalmic artery than younger people, and uh, of course the aneurysm size. So how many, uh, how many pipelines are enough? Now we're talking about covering you know, aneurysm. It reminds me my wife when she goes shopping, how many shoes are enough, how many dresses are enough? We keep on shopping, but anyway, uh, this is not my wife, this is a picture from the internet, okay? Uh, so, uh, this is one of the early cases, just quickly. Initially, when the pipeline came out, we were all mesmerized by the flow, and we're creating a jet of flow, and each time we would place a pipeline, we'd look, oh, I think there's a flow, depends where you stand, you look, you can see a flow, some people would hallucinate and see more flow. Anyway, this is the patient that had a cavernous aneurysm, one pipeline, stasis of contrast, then the patient came back with bad headaches, retroorbital pain. This was seven years ago. Well, now, if the patient comes back, I know that, yeah, go home, be on steroids, you'll be fine. But initially, we got the patient, we admitted the patient, we got the CAT scan, and then we repeated an angiogram, which to start with, I don't think there was any indication to do that. And then here it is, a week later, we see this, and then we decided to add one more pipeline, and then we saw another flow, and we decided to add one more pipeline, and here it is, okay? So again, well, there are a lot of things that we realized that we didn't know before. So a single pipeline is enough to treat aneurysms. This is the paper that we published showing that if you add one uh, more pipeline, it will not improve your uh, occlusion rate, but it will increase your complication rate. Uh, I'm talking also about aneurysms that failed, med failed pipeline. This is a paper that just got accepted in Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, when we looked at uh, what could be the causes of uh, not responding to pipelines. So it, it was 52 aneurysms, and 17% uh, were fusiform, uh, 16 patients underwent ret retreatment, or 30%, and there was a trend uh, for uh, uh, higher odds of retreatment when more than one pipeline was used. Overall, the treatment failure was 16%. Those are a little bit the aneurysms of the, uh, uh, of the series, of the paper. Uh, and I'm going to go quickly for the sake of time. Larger aneurysms and mainly, uh, so the summary, uh, prior stenting placement across the target aneurysm would uh, decrease the, risk, the chances of the aneurysm to respond to pipeline. The aneurysm location, distal aneurysms, less likely to respond. And follow-up duration, this is a little bit tricky. I think this is a bias because once, an, uh, in our practice, once an aneurysm is gone with pipeline, we don't follow it anymore. Definitely, if the aneurysm is still filling, we're going to follow it. So uh, posterior communicating ulterior aneurysm, also we talked about that. Uh, I think that uh, fetal PCOM is a limitation for pipeline. I'm going to go quickly about that. This is the paper we published uh, about PCOM aneurysm. This is an aneurysm, fetal PCA, we treated with pipeline. We waited now two years, it's still uh, filling. Uh, another case of a partially thrombosed uh, PCOM aneurysm that we treated with pipeline, uh, again, kept still filling, and we ended up clipping the uh, residual. Same thing here, uh, another fetal PCA with pipeline that still looks the same at 18 months. Uh, and again, of course, uh, the dolicoectatic uh, posterior circulation aneurysms. Uh, this is an aneurysm that was coiled elsewhere, then came back and the aneurysm kept on growing. The patient had multiple stents and kept on growing, and that's the issue. That's the problem that we were talking about earlier. It's not the aneurysm, it's the mass effect. I can make this look good like that, you know? I was proud of myself, I made the aneurysm look good. Did I do any good for the patient? Absolutely not. I pushed the patient toward the tracheostomy and the feeding tube earlier than what would have done the natural history of the disease. So nowadays, if I have a patient like this, I would not uh, treat, treat him uh, that way, especially if the patient's gonna need a shunt, for example. In those cases where we predict that the patient may need a shunt, it's better to shunt the patient than do the pipeline. In this case, uh, the patient came back with hydrocephalus, and here it is the problem where dual antiplatelet ter therapy and uh, shunting. So I think it's a match between you and the device. It's like match.com, like dating, exactly, like in a couple. You get to know each other in the couple, and you get to know each other, you and the pipeline device, or the flow diverter. 
You get to anticipate the reaction to your action. You get to learn to avoid embarrassing situations like in any relationship, same thing. And you get to know how much to ask from your partner and how much to ask from your pipeline and avoid pushing to a nervous breakdown. Conclusion, I think we should know the limitation. It's not a flow diverter failure, it's an indication failure. Uh, we should use all the armamentarium that's available. We should stay open-minded. Uh, there are a lot of technology, new technology, and we don't have to treat every anosm with pipeline. You know, you will be able to treat it one way or the other. Earlier, there were interesting lectures about, you know, balloon-assisted, and you're going to tomorrow see a lot of uh, other things. So, uh, learning curve. In, like in any device, there is a learning curve. This is uh, one of the first paper we published about learning curve, how uh, it's steep with pipeline, and the uh, complication rate decreases. So, I'm going to finish with... Uh, uh, movie on technology. As you know, technology is important, but it's a double-edged sword. Uh, where's the audio? Is there an audio hookup? Thank you. Let's see. It's up. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Huh? Emma. Emma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jabbar, for a nice presentation. I think I think the most important slide you showed, I, which I have not seen in any presentation of uh, flow diverters, is what we know, we don't know, and what we don't know, yeah. we don't know. So still, a lot of things right. to know. So any questions, please? Pascal, hi. Um, I mean, you, you guys have only pipeline. You guys in US only have pipeline at the yes. moment. We are very lucky in Europe. We got Surpass, P64. Yeah, I've used in the trial Surpass and FRED and everything, but they are not approved yet. Right. I mean, if you have Surpass, then you quite often don't need a long, you know, you don't need multiple stents like pipeline because Surpass comes with a very long lens although pipeline now also has long. What do you think is a true complication rate of flow diverters? If you look at all the meetings now, and so I think I th it's much higher than the published literature, I think. I think the rate of complication, and it depends on anterior or posterior circulation. I think if you look yeah. at a posterior circulation complication rate, particularly yeah. the basilar termination, yeah. the rates are very, very high. Yeah. I think to answer your question, we need to define what's a complication, okay? And this is where, you know, you can, you can show a paper and two people would argue the paper and each one will uh, t take you toward one. What's the exact meaning of complication? I think if we're going to talk about any complication, even a diffusion hit on MRI that's asymptomatic, complication rate is close to 10 to 15%. If we're going to talk about complication, serious advance ev adverse event, it's, uh, I would say, 5 to 6% is a reasonable number that you see in the literature. But that is the anterior circulation. Well, yeah. So the posterior circulation is a totally different disease. Uh, the, not all the posterior circulation aneurysms are under the same umbrella. There are some regular saccular aneurysms of the posterior circulation. Those we published on that, the complication rate is the same. But there are those giant, dolicoectatic, ugly aneurysms of the posterior circulation. This is a totally different animal. I agree with you. The complication rate is very high, and I don't, I don't offer pipeline to those patients anymore. I mean, Michelle presented uh, on uh, 
Michel Priotin presented on basilar termination, flow diverters, and the complication rate is not even 10. It's about 25 to 30 percent complication rate. It's very high, and that's the problem. I think we, to justify a flow diverter in a basilar termination at the moment, is not an easy decision. I don't know what Shabal thinks. So I fully agree with the fact that uh, they are different uh, aneurysms. So the, the one which is a dissecting and the one which is a regular one. Uh, so uh, when they report 25% of complication with the basilar tip aneurysm, which kind of complication are they? Is it the, the occlusion of the perforators, or is it a thromboembolic event, or whatever? So I think it's complete total looking at everything. Perforators. Yeah. So so I don't believe in the fact that the perforators could be occluded in a regular aneurysm because when you place the flow diverter among a uh, a perforator, this is a terminal artery, and so all the studies showed that over the terminal arteries, like the lenticular striate like the perforators, so they don't occlude. So it's impossible to occlude them because they keep aspirating. And so di we didn't face this kind of complication on the posterior circulation when the aneurysm was regular. But when it's, it is this in this dissecting aneurysm, the perforators are inside the dissection. And here the history is totally different. So the major part, so what increases the risk of complication in the posterior <laughs> circulation is the occlusion of those perforators. And they are occluded usually when we have this dissection and this big aneurysm, uh, uh, dissecting aneurysm. So for the regular circulation, we didn't have more complication in, on the posterior circulation than on I the I agree. Anterior. And then I when I say posterior circulation, in my opinion, I don't think pipeline is an indication for bifurcating aneurysms. Yeah. I'm talking about sidewall posterior circulation. I think we can take this discussion uh, in the subsequent se sessions about the complications in FD. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Moniar for his talk on sizing of the devices. As all of us who are doing flow diversions, we know that sizing is the key for successful outcome, among other <laughs> factors. So Thank you. So uh, the lecture of Dr. Jabour is uh, the one, uh, so it's a very nice introduction to, uh, to my presentation. So I hope I will get it on the screen. Okay, so the question is, when do we have to oversize, undersize, or tailor? First, I would like to start by saying that we never undersize a flow diverter. I never undersize. So the question is, when do we have to tailor or to oversize the uh, flow diverter? So I'll explain why I don't undersize the flow diverters when uh, I use them. First of all, so the question is, when you put a flow diverter, what's the effect on the aneurysm? We are looking to a flow diversion to exclude the aneurysm by thrombosis inside. So we will see after what, where do we have to put the coils inside before uh, deploying the flow diverter. So uh, we create an anatomical reconstruction of the artery. Uh, so all, flow, uh, all stents that we use are flow diverters. So uh, uh, the question is, uh, what are we looking for? So to rectify the artery, to modify the anatomy, or to create this thrombosis inside the sac. So uh, uh, the flow diverters are braided stents. Uh, so uh, they have a high metal coverage and a low porosity. This is why they are flow diverters. So uh, this is what creates the flow diversion, and the flow diversion is defined the, to, to be over a stent which has more than 30% of metal coverage. The ideal, uh, ideal porosity is of 70%. So uh, uh, you can see here the difference of uh, uh, conventional stent and the uh, uh, flow diverter one. And so the metal coverage is uh, much higher in the flow diverters. Uh, like, uh, uh, and so one flow diverter uh, is at about three uh, braided stents. Like uh, when, if you take the silk, for example, in Balt company, so the silk is uh, three layers in a tele telescopic shape. 
so it means that uh, uh, we increase the me metal coverage by, uh, uh, by increasing the meshes of the stent. Huh? So, uh, uh, all, as I said, all the stents could make a flow diversion, so which is really very important is to higher this uh, metal coverage and to lower the porosity on the neck of the edwards. So, the size of the stent is really very important in order to obtain this flow diversion. So by uh, undersizing, you can see here on this diagram, so by undersizing this tent, you can uh, 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 increase the metal coverage over, uh, over the neck, and this coverage is not a, a linear. It's, it's totally, uh, it's, a, it's a curve. Uh, it's exponential, uh, so uh, we are playing at around uh, one millimeter in diameter difference. So when we say we are oversizing, we are oversizing of one millimeter the diameter of the stand. You will see uh, later on, so just on the next one perhaps. So uh, when you undersize your, uh, your uh, flow diverter, uh, you uh, increase the coverage over the neck of your aneurysm and you higher uh, the flow diversion, so everybody knows that. Uh, uh, we, uh, if you look to, the, to this uh, paper which was published recently, uh, uh, showing that uh, if uh, you put a flow diverter uh, which is uh, 3.4.25 uh, here, so this is a pipeline that they put uh, 3.4.25 uh, that they put in different diameters so, uh, of a tube. Uh, when you put it in different diameters, you can see how the meshes are uh, tied here, so the meshes are closed. So we have a height a flow diversion when we are over a vessel which is 4.5, and so you can see how the meshes will be opened once uh, the uh, vessel is decreasing in size, but when you will arrive to two millimeters here, so when the size is really uh, very important between the diameter of the, of the flow diverter and the size of uh, the uh, vessel, you can see that this uh, beta ang angle here will be opened again, and so we will lose the flow diversion. So this is why I'm saying that if we want to mod modify the flow diversion, we modify it over one millimeter in diameter of the stent, and not more. So, <clears throat> this is uh, the same thing here, so uh, just uh, an explanation, so I will go over it uh, very quickly because uh, we don't have enough time. Uh, so, we have to take care of the geometry of the vessel as well, so when you have uh, a curve over uh, regarding the neck of the aneurysm, you, you know that over the convexity, the meshes are much open then over the concavity of the, of the artery, here, like here. So uh, this is an example, an aneurysm which was covered by a flow diverter. You can see that on the inner uh, part of the stent, uh, uh, you can see that uh, it's, uh, uh, the, 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 the meshes are very, very tiny, and so uh, you have a uh, exclusion of the, uh, of the aneurysm, like here. Uh, so, uh, another case, so uh, over the convexity, you can see the diameters of the artery over 4 millimeter, uh, diameter 2 uh, is uh, 5.2, uh, which is really very important for me, is to apply completely the stent among the wall of the artery, and the pipeline, as you know, is a cobalt chromium one, like uh, the surpass, and so the cobalt chromium has a higher radial force, then uh, the 19 oil, uh, so here we've chosen uh, a 4.5, uh, so it means that we oversized just a bit because the orientation of the ophthalmic artery was coming from the inner part of the artery, and so we know by a study which was done in the department that this is a situation which is a bit complicated regarding the uh, ischemia over uh, the ophthalmic nerve, and so you can see here the total exclusion of the sac. So it resembles to the case which was shown previously. This is a pica aneurysm which was coiled during the rupture and the patient come back. And here, so we can say that we will make the same thing than in the previous case and we can put a pipeline over the vertebral artery reducing like this the flow inside the sac. But this is not what we, what, what we did because it's, uh, uh, it's not sure that the aneurysm will be occluded, especially that here, 
probably the pica will be still patent after the procedure. So how to keep the pica patent? And uh, uh, so uh, uh, we exclude completely the sac, so it could happen, but it's not sure. So this is why we put coils uh, over uh, the, uh, uh, in the aneurysm again in order to be sure without occluding the neck and keeping the pica patent, but here we oversize a bit our flow diverter in order to reduce the flow diversion because we coil the sac and after what our goal is to uh, uh, reduce the flow at uh, the origin of the pica and here you can see that the uh, stent uh, is placed in the uh, vertebral artery and here we are much more sure that the aneurysm will be occluded with the long, uh, with long time. So now, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Jabour said uh, previously, so the flow diversion depends of the shunted artery as well. And so we have what we call the flow, uh, 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 what, what we call the, the bifurcation aneurysm. So sometimes we are obliged to put these flow diverters over the bifurcation, but we have to understand how to put it and whatever. So uh, uh, this is what we call the Limoges classification. We published the paper so uh, uh, about the shunted artery. And so when we are speaking about the shunted artery, we are speaking about the brain. So we have to understand how the brain will be supplied once uh, we place the flow diverter. So this is the group A in our classification. So in the group A, uh, the shunted artery is connected directly with a natural uh, communicating artery like here. So if you put the flow diverter here, your goal is to occlude the aneurysm with the artery because the brain is supplied by the contralateral side and here you tailor your stent in the uh, uh, group A, we tailor our, our stent in order to increase the meshes of the stent and to, to create a height flow diversion because here our goal is to occlude the aneurysm with the shunted artery. So this is a variant here, so A1, A2, when we are uh, shunting the communicating artery, we are shunting and in all situation, the flow is anterograde and uh, so here we tailor the stent and we occluded the aneurysm at the same time. So this was a case of uh, a blister-like and whatever, so uh, which we treated in the acute phase. So uh, this is a group A. Uh, 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 we put the flow diverter over the junction between a1, A2, and so because the fact that the contralateral side is supplied by the uh, contralateral uh, carotid artery, you can see here that the anvis was excluded and the communicating artery as well. You can see here the left uh, uh, um, cerebral artery, um, carotid artery uh, compression. So you can see here that uh, even with the compression, we don't see anymore the communicating artery, and so the anvis is cured. Uh, so this is another case of the group A. You can see here that we have a, a normal communicating artery, this ugly aneurysm uh, here. So to put the coils here, you have to put the balloon and whatever and to, uh, to occlude the three lobes of the aneurysm. So before the procedure, we made a Q-flow with the MRI over uh, both A1s. And you can see here that uh, on the right A1, we are over 0.8 milliliter per second uh, speed. And here we have over one on the left A1. You can see here that the anterior communicating artery is patent. So we placed a, uh, a stent, uh, a, a flow diverter over A1, A2, uh, termination of the um, carotid artery and M1 here. And so we shunted the aneurysm with the artery and we made a Q-flow immediately after the procedure. And the Q-flow showed that uh, on the right A1, the flow became immediately negative. It means that the flow was coming already from the contralateral side. The uh, anterior uh, communicating artery is patent and we higher the speed on the contralateral side. Why? Because it's supplying both anterior cerebral artery territories. And so uh, at three months follow up, you can see that the aneurysm is excluded with the A1 here, uh, the right A1 and the uh, left uh, A1 is taking care of both anterior uh, cerebral artery territory. So uh, I go through this case uh, uh, quickly. Okay, so we arrive to the group B. The group B is totally different than the group A. 
So uh, the shunted artery here, it doesn't have any possibility of communication with the natural communicating artery, and the only possibility that the territory will be supplied from somewhere will be the leptomeningeal arteries. And so uh, this is a case uh, that we did. So this is not very demonstrative. I will give you the second one. Uh, which is much more demonstrative than this one because I don't have enough time. So, for example, this uh, uh, callosal artery here, the shunted artery will be this frontal artery here. If you put a pipeline here, you can see, you, you will shunt the aneurysm uh, and the uh, frontal artery. Uh, and after the pipeline, you can see here that you excluded the aneurysm, but the artery is narrowing. Why? Because the leptomeningeal have been developed and the territory is uh, taking, uh, taking the flow by the leptomeningeal artery. So this was our first case uh, uh, with uh, the group B uh, flow diverter. So this was a patient who had bl uh, bled, and you know that uh, René was previous to me in Limoges uh, in 2004-2005. Uh, 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 so he made the coiling of the sac with uh, this, uh, th this uh, group of coil here. And uh, so you can believe me, the result after the procedure was A. Uh, he came back with the recanalization and I made the second uh, package here. And so he came back again with this recanalization and we had the flow diverters and we said, let's go for a flow diverter here. So you can ask yourself, uh, where do we have to put the flow diverter? On the downer branch, on the red one, or on the blue one? So uh, the question is really very important here. So anatomically speaking, we, are, we have tendency to put the stent over the downer one. So from M M1 to the posterior temporal artery here. So this is what we did, but I think that we were wrong on this first case. So let's look to the 60 images per second here. So if you look to the 60 images per second, you can see that the downer branch is already filled by the contrast medium and the upper branch, uh, branch is not. Why? Because the upper branch is taken from the sac itself. So if you put the flow diverter over the downer branch, you will reduce the flow over the upper branch and over the sac itself. So uh, if you see it like this, so you can see that the downer branch is in a laminar, uh, laminar uh, regimen and the upper branch is over a turbulent regimen coming from the sac. So this is what we did. We put the stent over the downer branch. You can see here the stent put over the downer branch. And uh, 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 four weeks later, the patient came back with a weakness over his hand. He had got an ischemia. Why? Because uh, he had got, so this is the angiogram which was made after uh, uh, this, uh, this stroke. So we can see here that the upper branch is totally shunted uh, here and so occluded at its origin. And if you look to the leptomeningeal supply, we have a very important uh, leptomeningeal supply. It means that we've got a competition between the flow coming from down and the, co uh, the flow coming from the leptomeningeal, but uh, a competition doesn't mean total perfusion. And as you know, the most functional areas need more blood, so we know it by the functional MRI right now. So the analysis here is the fact that we have a laminar regimen over the downer branch and the turbulent regimen coming from the up. Uh, if we put a stent here, uh, so over the downer branch, so we reduce the speed over the upper one and so we increase the speed over the downer one. So uh, we have two scenarios. The first one will be the development of the leptomeningeal and like this, we can occlude the aneurysm with the, with the, with the uh, branch, the shunted artery, like the experiment which was made by Calmes regarding the aneurysm that he created on the subclavian artery of the rabbit. And he put the flow diverter, so the flow diverter co was covered completely by uh, uh, the endothelium because there is no shunted branch and there is no aspiration. Uh, so this is the situation which explains the uh, occlusion of the sac with the shunted artery. The second scenario is the absence of the le these leptomeningeal arteries. And here you have a risk 
to get the same experiment that he made when he put the flow diverter over the origin of the uh, renal artery. And here you have aspiration and at three weeks he found this hole inside. And if we have still this hole inside our center, so we can keep the aneurysm patent uh, with the shunted artery. The ideal situation is to put the stent over the upper branch and like this, because the fact that, uh, so we will higher the speed over the upper branch, but because the fact that the downer branch was laminar, so uh, uh, here it will keep aspirating like regarding the renal artery and we exclude the aneurysm by keeping the flow in both branches. So when it's not possible, like in our case, it's not so easy to put the flow diverter over the upper branch, what we have to do is probably to increase the speed over the upper branch by putting coils inside uh, the aneurysm. So like this, we will higher the speed over the upper one and we can put the stent over the downer one. So this is how we analyze. We cannot anticipate the development of the leptomeningeal, but by analyzing like this, we will reduce the rate of complication by the ischemia. Uh, uh, so, uh, for us, when we are in a group B, we oversize our stent because we don't want to occlude the artery and we put coils inside the sac. Like in this case, so uh, recanalization and recanalization after rupture of the aneurysm and whatever, and at one time we put coils and uh, this one was uh, hopefully neuroform, uh, so uh, open cell stents. So we decided to put a pipeline inside this open cell stent, this neuroform, but before, look here so you can see that the posterior temporal artery is arising from the neck of the sac. And here we decided to, uh, after our experience with the fir first case, we decided to jail coils inside the sac with the pipeline. And you can see at the end of the procedure that the temporal artery is still patent. Now, if you look to the control at six months and you look to the 60 images per second, you can see that the aneurysm is totally excluded with the artery, which is still patent. Here is the demonstration of the necessity, necessity sometimes to uh, put uh, coils uh, inside the sac. I will finish by just uh, this case. Uh, this case is not mine, it's uh, Marco Tullio's one. Uh, I will show it uh, in the next uh, presentation. So uh, he put uh, the derivo here, which is a nitinol uh, flow diverter over this sac. And so you can see here that at the end of the procedure, so uh, the, the, the stent was not totally applied over the wall of the artery. And this is why I never undersize the stent. So either I will tailor or I oversize. Don't forget that the 3D will give you the size of the lumen of the vessel, but you don't see the size of the wall of the vessel its, uh, itself. So this is why you, you need to get a very nice apply of the stent among the wall of the artery, uh, because uh, here, if you keep this space, which is uh, uh, figured in, uh, in red here, so you have a high risk of thromboembolic events. So uh, I will finish by that. Uh, uh, in conclusion, so we tailor in, uh, in uh, common situations, uh, carotid siphon aneurysm, bifurcation aneurysm with good collateral uh, circulation group A. Uh, and so uh, we have to get a very attention to the 3D because it doesn't give us the real diameter of the vessel uh, we oversize in the group B after coiling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mayanwar, for a very nice talk. Uh, we can have one question, please, because we are running behind schedule. So one question, please. Thank you. Um, if there's a giant aneurysm in the cavernous sinus and you have applied a flow diverter, there's partial occlusion, which is slow. Um, how long would you like to wait in this situation for it to occlude? And if it just remains like that for two, three years, four years, what do you do? Mm. <clears throat> so I don't wait for uh, three, four years uh, if I have still a, uh, a patency inside the sac. So we make uh, globally a control at 18 months. So uh, our protocol is, uh, is uh, the first control at six months and the second at 18 months after the procedure. And if we have still patency inside, 
So uh, we try to put another stent, but as Dr. Jabour said, so uh, uh, if you put another stent inside, it's not absolutely not sure that you will exclude totally the aneurysm. So if you put another stent inside, you have to cover the proximal part of the previous stent down, because if you don't cover it usually, so over the cavernous sinus, because there is no aspiration, no shunted arteries here, so it means that your stent is not very well applied over the wall of the artery. And if you put another stent inside the previous one, it will not be applied. So what I make, so I put a longer stent, huh? I cover the proximal part of the previous stent and I put the balloon inside and I, will f uh, I inflate it. Now, nowadays, so uh, when I use a, a, a flow diverter, which is a nitinol flow diverter, not a cobalt chromium, because the not a cobalt chromium, we can see the stent, huh? on our screen when we are deploying. But when I use a nitinol stent, uh, which is uh, all the stents, flow diverters, uh, when you exclude the pipeline and the surpass. So they are cobalt chromium and the others are all nitinol. So when I put a nitinol flow diverter, I finish always by putting a balloon inside and inflating inside in order to be sure that it's totally applied over the wall. Even when we have this microdynacity uh, or whatever, and so you don't see exactly if the stent is applied totally over the wall. And because of the fact that uh, the nitinol has less radial force, it doesn't apply very well all the time. So this is why I finish all the time by putting a balloon I, and I inflating it. So. That we can take Thank you, uh, Dr. Like aneurysms, and the other one is a case that made his heart stop for a minute. So uh, over to Dr. Lopez, please. Good morning, India, New Delhi, uh, Dr. Uh, Vipu. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, um, I enjoyed very much watching the talks of Pascal and, uh, and Charbel. So uh, uh, bonjour, Pascal, bonjour, uh, Charbel. Um, my topic uh, is very I, dear to my heart. I think this is, uh, we have uh, about eight minutes to present, and uh, I will show you just cases of uh, vertebral basal disease. As you can see the first slide, uh, this is a really um, a challenging case because it is uh, the presentation of vertebral basal disease with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So. You don't have a lot of options. This aneurysm has to be treated. In this case, we were able to initially treat with, a, a, in 2007, when he presented, we used a stenting coil technique, and that's what we had available to us. I think the lesson here is that this type of aneurysm, um, especially when you have a, a concern that it's a dissecting vertebral basal aneurysm, you need to follow up because uh, this is um, uh, clearly in 2014, there's a, you know, a double in the size, a much worse disease. Uh, the stenting coil that we knew at that time seemed to be the best treatment, allowed us to fix the energy in the acute phase, but to repair this, um, we clearly would have to make a case for full diversion. I think the lesson on this case for me is the issue of uh, today having flow diversion. This may be a situation to use flow diverters and coil on the initial presentation. So it could be a case that you may need to use uh, on the subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, use of coil with flow diversion to avoid to have recurrences. But if you want were to coil only or use stenting coil, be careful that the recurrence is very important. So the yearly scans to follow up these patients is very important. And um, so the other thing I think is very important is to have uh, a uh, uh, watch uh, for aortic aneurysms and iliac aneurysms. It's very possible that uh, you need to sort out between dissecting aneurysm or atherosclerotic aneurysms. Many times the age or his or hypertension are very helpful to dictate that this may be an atherosclerotic aneurysm, but uh, uh, the sometimes not so easy to separate them. And uh, so clearly this is an important uh, distinction to be made. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a patient that has a subarachnoid hemorrhage and you need to place either flow diverter or a stent, uh, you likely will need to use antiplatelets. So we, I think uh, as a tip, it's very important to place the ventriculostomy before you do the intervention. 
and then um, uh, you decide that the regimen we tend to do uh, load with uh, um, two B three A's, uh, and more recently the use of Kangrelor it may be a good choice, uh, so that you don't need to load the patient with aspirin plavix prior to the procedure. So in these cases, the ventriculostomy is in position, the patient is loaded with um, aspirin plavix or any antiplatelets that you choose, but you have to make a decision if the patient requires to have a shunt placed we need to make a transition from ventriculostomy to ventricular peritoneal shunt. And I think this is a very important decision because in these cases, we in the past used to remove the ventriculostomy and place uh, a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Nowadays, we cut the EVD and uh, just use the same EVD catheter connected now to a, a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So we don't replace the intracranial catheter that the catheter remains the same. We just cut, use a connector, and place the ventricular peritoneal shunt. This is to avoid uh, interparenchymal hemorrhage and perhaps a delay or uh, in, uh, interventricular hemorrhage and, and having to cancel the case because of the blood. The other thing that, um, so in these type of cases, I would recommend, I would say that uh, uh, for ventricular basal enters with hemorrhagic presentation, I would say coil yes. Uh, preoperative ventriculostomy. It likely will need uh, antiplatelets because of the use of flow diversion and stents. And follow up imaging is forever. Make sure that you don't miss these patients because they tend to reoccur. This is another case, which is, uh, I think it's also a very interesting presentation is the mass effect causing hydrocephalus. And this is a problem, it's an acute hydrocephalus situation. So in this case, the patient was. Uh, uh, living with a, a large aneurysm, the patient had been <coughs> partially treated, but then um, there was clearly a change. The patient presents with acute hydrocephalus. So at this point, the uh, patient was treated by placement of uh, a, a ventricular peritoneal shunt to address the hydrocephalus. The problem is that uh, an hour after the, the ventricular peritoneal shunt was placed, the patient had a hemorrhage. And the problem with this, I think, is that uh, if you have a, a decompensation of an, uh, somebody that's been stable, it likely indicates that there is a recent growth of the aneurysm. And placement of a shunt or EVD, a ventriculostomy, in that phase, it could precipitate a hemorrhage of the aneurysm, a rupture of the aneurysm. So um, in this case was... Uh, I think that the uh, advice would have been to repair the aneurysm and then place the shunt. Or if you're going to do the shunt you, or a ventriculostomy, you cannot overdrain. You has to it has to be very controlled the drainage. So I think the tip in this case is, is early uh, a presentation of acute hydrocephalus, um, in, certainly in a known thrombose aneurysm be very careful because it's a sudden change in the size of the aneurysm that likely cause the hydrocephalus and one should address the aneurysm first or if address hydrocephalus, don't overdrain, be very careful. So probably a ventriculostomy would be better than a shunt and um, with a controlled drainage. I think that's it, the, the tip on this case. This is, um, so this is uh, the, the, the occlusion of the, uh, in this case, we actually had to occlude the vertebral artery that led to the aneurysm and uh, with the aneurysm. And uh, you had to deal with uh, the, um, uh, the hydrocephalus like we, we described. Now, the third situation is when you have mass effect. And this is a really nice picture it's from the Buffalo group. Uh, is the interpretation of uh, how the clot forms in these aneurysms that are partially thrombosed and, a, and, and it's a hollow basilar aneurysm and the channels that are keeping those perforators alive. So it's, I think it's a very illustrative picture because many times you don't see when you do an angiogram, you see just uh, the pathway where the blood is going. But always remember that there is a lot of clot between the lumen, the false lumen, and the wall, the original wall of the artery. And this should be very important because this is a case of a, a relatively healthy person who was a marathon runner that developed an unsteady gait 
very mild symptoms, but a large uh, secular thrombosed portion of this uh, uh, mid-basal aneurysm. And um, this is what it looked like. So this is a relatively simple case, early presentation with uh, in a healthy patient, very minimal symptoms. This is a classic case that uh, we would not place coils and just use a flow diverter on this case. Um, and this is a, it seemed to be a no brainer, but it's important to do always the MRI and the DSA in these cases, always compare because the MRI will be a good measure of uh, the, um, how your treatment was effective. So remember in vertebral basilar disease, uh, always use MRI and DSA to assess your, the efficacy of your treatment. Now, this is a different beast. It's not quite a vertebral basilar, but it's a great example of uh, an aneurysm that has, um, this is a, uh, the original imaging with uh, some mass effect, but you see the angiogram showing complete occlusion of the aneurysm. With this is, was using standing coil technique, so there's no feeling of the aneurysm, but the aneurysm kept growing in size. So this is the aneurysm that is angiographic occult, but with progressive growth. These cases we have uh, uh, failed many times because we tend to uh, try to do steroids and more steroids, and eventually you lose neurological function, but you're not able to improve uh, the patient uh, despite of taking many courses, steroids did not get better. So I think the solution for this type of situation is if you try the steroids, uh, we try now one to two weeks, if that doesn't work, then we go to surgery to remove the mass effects from these lesions. Um, I think the mistake is to wait too long and develop a neurological deficit that will be irreversible. Um, so I think this is a situation of the completely, in, not infrequently, these are uh, three uh, months or maybe even more, six months, eight months, after treatment, so the endothelialization should be completely done at the lumen, so you can actually open the dome of the aneurysm and there won't be any bleeding coming. This is all at the wall of the aneurysm that is causing this uh, reaction and uh, this growth. So there's nothing, you can cut into it and you debulk of it and then you have probably the best outcome. Now, we also would like to share the experience we have had uh, since 2014 uh, we put together this concept of uh, how to deal with these vertebral basal aneurysms, but um, it really for me seemed to be more how to con control the clotting of the aneurysm cell. So we tend not to occlude completely the aneurysm, we tend to, to um, uh, do a gradual thrombosis of the aneurysm. And this is a little bit of the technical aspects of it, how we go about this. Uh, the tendency was not to place full divergers at the top of the basilar, we always like to, to use a smaller coverage at the top of the basilar. And from ICA below, we tend to use full diverters. Uh, we don't occlude the contralateral vertebral artery in the acute phase. And also, of course, the antiplatelet therapy is very important to be very rigorous about that. This is the example. Um, uh, it's a case that has, this is all thrombosed aneurysm. This is, of course, one lesion, the whole thing. but. Um, uh, we felt that the ICA was coming right in here. So this segment, we didn't want to anchor a, 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 a flow diverter on the top of the basal artery. So we use a lower coverage. In the, uh, so we build it the, the construct with the high enterprise and pipeline mix and use some coils in the, to help on that. So you can see that the flow diverter is barely anchored uh, below ICA. So this is a relatively unstable situation. But when, in this case, we did uh, the flow diverter first and then the, um, the anchor, the enterprise later on. Uh, but I think uh, since then we've been placing first the enterprise and then the flow diverter inside of the enterprise. Um, you can use uh, Elvis or any other anchor uh, for this uh, type of construct but it was a nice combination with low coverage in the areas with more perforators and higher coverage down below. The use, the occlusion of the, perfor or the vertebral artery in the contralateral side, we only do if the patient has uh, continuation having symptoms. 
If the patient is uh, doing well, we tend not to occlude the vertebral artery, but we have to follow up the patient relatively closely clinically and also with imaging. And that means uh, in a monthly basis, in the first to six months, we, we follow up these patients to know if their um, non-occlusion of the vertebral artery is being, um, it's okay. Uh, it's very possible that uh, if you, the vertebral arteries are not symmetric, if they are uh, about the um, same size, I think uh, it seems to be the cases that we end up doing staged occlusion of the vertebral artery. But if there's a discrepancy, the hypoplastic vertebral artery, many times we don't need to occlude at all and it remains uh, feeling the aneurysm second thrombosis gradually, which is what exactly what we wanted to do. This is the appearance of this reconstruction. This is the, the pre and the post, and this is showing the construct, how we wanted to do. So in these cases of vertebral bias large with mass effect, coil, yes, but selective. This is usually in the cases they have, have a huge aneurysm sac, we tend to do the uh, coiling. Uh, if you have uh, uh, the clot management concept is very important so that partial thrombosis don't go too fast, uh, don't try to fix everything in one day. So the, the vertebral artery occlusion uh, in a staged fashion, uh, assess the size of the vertebral arteries and decide uh, on that as well as the follow-up, with clinical follow-up and uh, uh, in a monthly basis is very important. <laughs> the hybrid construct, I would definitely recommend uh, in these cases. Now, this is a case uh, that presents a very interesting because it presents with ischemia. Uh, so this is now showing all the spectrum of this disease from hemorrhagic, mass effect, and now uh, we talk about uh, the mass effect directly into the parenchyma, mass effect causing hydrocephalus, mass effect causing uh, the, uh, um, with completely occluded aneurysm, and now we're talking about ischemic. This is a case that presents with a basilar artery occlusion and there's a large clot inside of the aneurysm. So these cases, uh, our recommendation is to do, uh, of course, do the mechanical thrombectomy first. Uh, we did not treat the aneurysm on an acute phase. The patient had received uh, a, a, a TPA, and uh, so we decided to uh, do the treatment for a stroke. It required two passes to repair. Uh, the the patient recovered from the event, uh, and then we had this type of uh, issue with the blood clot inside of the aneurysm, and uh, but recanalized. So in these cases, then you do uh, the flow diversion in a delayed fashion before the patient is discharged from the hostel. But I think that uh, it's a completely different situation, and uh, I think that uh, the uh, importance here is to, uh, of course, address the mechanical thrombectomy first and then the aneurysm treatment um, uh, in a somewhat elective prior to discharge because the clot was a big, the clot burden there was a big concern what was gonna happen with that. So we didn't wanna let the patient go home or go to rehabilitation on those uh, with a, a blood clot inside of the aneurysm. Um, but this is a, a very challenging situation and I don't recommend to place a full diverter in an acute phase of a post stroke. So in this case, it's coil, rare, uh, clot management concept, hybrid construct with selective control of vertebral coiling, I think applies to this, depending if the energy is below ICA or above ICA. Now, this is another case that uh, is the energy that doesn't have a belly, so it has mass effect, but it's very thrombosed. So there's a channel reconstructed inside of the, uh, the clot without having the uh, large uh, saccular component to it. So I have to say, in this patient was uh, relatively stable for a period of time, with a, but heavy mass effect symptoms. Uh, so there was a lot to lose because he was somewhat still function, but progressing to a deterioration with this type of uh, lesion, extensive, very tortuous. And in these cases, we have hesitated to treat with full divergence. In this case, I think using the old construct with a very simple, these are actually a number of uh, four enterprises. I think it's a very gentle treatment for this, but it may provide the stability to the clot that we need. Uh, I, I, my concern here is to, if you go to place of flow diversion in this case, you quickly can de decompensate this patient um, to a progressive thrombosis. I think here you wanna have just a, a construct 
that provides uh, uh, some structure to the blood clot that's formed. This is all, uh, you have only attachment above and below. Everything in the middle is just clot with channels going to the perforator. So you want to disrupt the minimal as possible this. And I think that uh, we don't have a good solution to this disease. I think that uh, this uh, management, it's still, this is a very old treatment for this. But for me, in a patient with a good condition, uh, mass effect in a, a thrombose lesion that doesn't have a huge cyclic component, it may be a good way to go about it. Okay, um, I wanted to, uh, this is, I, I, we can go on in a few things, but I wanted to give about uh, two minutes now for questions. Do you have any questions? Thank you for dealing on this very complicated topic. My question is, uh, if there is a bleed, and then you say that you want to first treat the vascular pathology with an external ventricular drain, and if this bleed is heavy, you won't be able to shunt the patient, and you already put the patient on antiplatelets. So how do you decide about the shunt in the coming days, once, once the patient needs a shunt? because the patient is already on antiplatelets. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. So that's, um, we placed the ventriculostomy prior to start the antiplatelets. The moment that we decide to do the, let's say if the patient does not win uh, from the ventricular uh, drainage, so we need to place a shunt. So we tend to place a, a long DVD. <coughs> And uh, we, we published this technique, so it's uh, a very straightforward because allows you to um, not have to, you can place a shunt, the only, you're not going to, you're going to cut the ventriculostomy here and connect. So, of course, you do the surgery on antiplatelets. We don't stop the antiplatelets. And we place the abdominal, the peritoneal catheter, with the patient on do on the platelets but the the cranial part the ventriculostomy we cut the evd and connect that to the peritoneal catheter and the valve so the valve and the peritoneal catheter are attached to the original evd is yep. that clear yep. no 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 my question is the blood load won't allow the shunt to work at least before three four weeks once the clot goes then only the shunt valve will work so do you wait for that time? Yes, yes. You have to. Um, we would, we would, we would probably, you know, the supracranial hemorrhage would have to clear before you make the decision on placing the shunt. Uh, so we will keep the EVD on until the burden of the supracranial hemorrhage goes away. Dr. Demetrius, okay. I have to interrupt okay. here. We are running short of time. There are other people who are wanting to do their live sessions as well. So I'd request you to go on with your next presentation and keep it short, as short as possible, please. This is very short, and I appreciate it. Yeah. I know you had been waiting for a long time as well. We this thank you for that. In Chicago right and now, Pascal and, uh, and Munair are also saying no hi from their end. There's this no storm here. All right, here, li listen, uh, this is the, the next case. It's uh, uh, the short summary of it. It basically shows um, it's a MCA aneurysm with an ICA aneurysm. And uh, my heart stopped a little bit on this one, but uh, you can see there's a, the situation is this a, a proximal aneurysm and a distal aneurysm. And then um, the idea, the concept is, how do you manage this without uh, um, we decided to do endovascularly, and the concern was how to protect the MCA aneurysm while we're deploying a flow diverter proximally so that the wire of the detachment system didn't push into the uh, aneurysm, the distal aneurysm. So this is um, a little bit of uh, how this whole thing went, and uh, I will go into details as we show the videos here. Hold on a second. So this is... Um, the situation i think anybody that does these cases will appreciate this we deployed first this is a we use a traxis uh stent a traxis wire 
and deploy an Elvis stand uh, across the MCA. And the, the reason to do that uh, was to avoid uh, any type of uh, wire going into the aneurysm from the delivery system of the, the, um, of the pipeline. Uh, the, on the detachment, unfortunately, the Elvis did not open as well proximally. So that was one issue we had. And then uh, this is now we're trying to get back into the aneurysm to do coiling. And uh, I'll move on quickly here. Um, so this is now going into the, um, we had a, a hard time getting back there, but here you can see what we did, we placed the, um, we have now the flow diverter wire is going in, but it's deflecting on the stand. So it's not going inside of the inners. This is the pipeline being deployed here. You see the deployment at this point, and you had a micro catheter already into the end. The same micro catheter used to deploy the Alvis was placed into the aneurysm for coiling of this aneurysm as the pipeline is protecting us. But the biggest question is what happens with the wire that is going distal? So when you have two aneurysms, your, your heart stops or you worry about because that distal wire, if it's going into an aneurysm or a small vessel, it could perforate that. And uh, I thought that uh, in this case, having the stent across was very helpful to give me some peace of mind that that was not going to happen. Um, and I'm sure that uh, everyone in this audience came across a situation like that. So we went ahead and coiled the aneurysm proximally, you can see here. And um, we did not worry as we got many pictures, the MC aneurysm was still intact. And then we came in and did, uh, at the end, we ent entered the, the aneurysm and coil also the um, the distal, the MC aneurysm have a result like that. This is uh, the final result there. So relatively quick, I just wanted to show and uh, get your opinion on a situation like that. When you have, uh, uh, as we go more distal with flow diverters, the, di the wire tip uh, hitting the anatomy that is distal small vessels or aneurysms if anybody came across similar problems and what do you do to protect yourself i think an I, one idea is to place a stent first in the distal aneurysm to protect yourself and then you deliver this uh the folder better approximate but that's that's all my message hopefully that was helpful thank you very much hello yeah uh dr demetrius thank it's me uh vipul gupta speaking can we have his email? Hi, hi, people. How hi. are you? <laughs> uh, terrific. Uh, these were great presentations, and I really thank you. You have been waiting for a while. I know the timing has been a little haywire, but we were so keen because we saw you had some papers on this issue, and we were so keen for you to talk on this. You know? Thank you so much, yeah, and uh, yeah. I hope it was helpful. I'm here. If you want to send me questions, I'll be glad to answer. Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, yeah uh, Tufel want to ask one question. Dimitris, what's the time there? Oh, it's about um, uh, midnight now. Uh, you're oh. going to be in trouble with your wife soon, aren't you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dimitris, uh, your second case, you had an MC aneurysm. It's an incidental aneurysm in a 71-year-old with the right MCA and an ICA termination. I know you don't, again, you guys don't have <coughs> self-pass. Otherwise, for me, I would have probably not treated that MCA. It was very small, wasn't it? It was less than seven millimeter, right? You're talking about uh, on the v this case here? The, the last case you showed. You showed yeah, an MCA one. and okay. an ICA termination aneurysm. So I, I think if it, it was the video uh, that I presented, it's, uh, it's actually a, it's a PCOM. Uh, multi-lobed. Uh, yeah, that, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I, uh, an MCA, yes. I, I think I can, you know, the the PCOM needs treating. It's fine. But the MCA, what was the reason to treat that? Because you were worried your pipeline wire is going to go and might perforate. Is that why you are trying to get the MCA? Yeah, done? I think I think that's the point we have. Uh, um, uh, so. Uh, we are right now actually are this tonight we had a dinner here in Chicago with a number of experts on flow diverter uh, about the Maverick uh, flow diverter and one of the discussions was the length of the wire that these devices should have 
And because the concern is as we go more distal and you can have this traumatizing the anatomy, especially if you have another aneurysm distally. So it, I think uh, is more to emphasize that uh, we know we came across in this case, I felt very comfortable having this stent across the neck of the aneurysm. Uh, coiling afterwards for me, uh, yeah, you could argue not to coil, but it, it was helpful to be able to, because you have no, the option to that would be to have a wire that you can uh, direct, you can uh, control the wire by torquing. But uh, today we don't have that in our full divert. So when you deploy, it goes where it goes. It's hard to direct uh, the, where, where it's heading to. And that could be a problem because if you have half of the full divert deployed, like I showed in that case, um, it, it, you, you have to go forward to deploy the device and that wire, you have no control where it's going. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could use a surpass, which, which might save you all that much hassle. Because again, you can put in a wire, you got more control. Um, and yeah, I think uh, the, the argument for the surpass, I think uh, uh, the new delivery system, I, I think will be better. But uh, I think uh, in, uh, in this uh, older patient, it's definitely a more difficult access than sure, sure, uh, the sure. pipeline is. You know, I think that, uh, that is, for me, the sure, argument sure. on that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think we'll conclude this talk. And let's give a round, uh, big round of applause for Dr. Lopez. Take care, guys. And Thank you so I'd much. Like, Have sorry. a great day. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Professor Henkes for his next talk on FD in fusiform aneurysms, the technique, how to deploy the devices. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much, people, for inviting me. And, um, I, I appreciate that you reduced my presentation time from 15 to 8 minutes, so I will speed up a, a little and uh, be as quick as reasonably possible. So um, this doesn't work. I have to have to disclose that I am a co-founder and shareholder of Phoenix, and um, I think it's it's reasonable to remember that treating a fusiform aneurysm with a flow diversion is completely different from uh, treating an, a secular aneurysm, and uh, I, I think I will make the, the case why this is true. So telescoping regular stents, uh, which is, which was for a long time. Uh, called poor man's flow diversion. It's cheaper and less risky, and, and I have to admit we still do it. These are just a few examples. This is a fusiform aneurysm. It was growing over time in relatively short time. We put an enterprise stand, and ultimately we put five enterprise stand, and you see the, the aneurysm was simply gone. It had no thrombus. MR was essentially normal after that. This was dissecting before aneurysm, before treatment, three enterprise stents, little effect, some uh, intima, and, and another three Leo stents, aneurysm gone, no, no aneurysm, no thrombus, nothing. This is uh, another uh, telescoping case, huge cavernous aneurysms treated before we had flow diverters. This is the result of three Leo stents, and um, uh, the three Leo stents, as uh, uh, Chabel mentioned before, had to be uh, adapted uh, with a, with a um, compliant balloon, but if you do it carefully, you can have a very similar effect. The um, combination of uh, stents and uh, flow diverters we, we don't actually like, and we have not, not so good experience with this. This is a case of a huge ruptured and thrombose aneurysm. Uh, prior to the availability of flow diverters, we had used a, a sol an enterprise and a solitaire. This is the inter enterprise outside, it was first deployed, followed by a solitary stand. You see the result, the, uh, the aneurysm started uh, throbbing. We didn't, didn't like the, the result and were stupid enough to put a flow diverter and occlude the artery. The patient was lucky enough to have very good collaterals and uh, survived it without any deficit, but it could have been the, the end of this poor guy. The separate flow diverter something special. Um, this is a uh, Basilar artery, 2006 and 2013. This was the spontaneous course of this man. The aneurysm was growing con considerably. We uh, put five, uh, four flow diverters, four pipelines uh, in 2013, one inside the other, as usual, 30% overlap. And um, we didn't 
consider the, the possibility of separating the, the flow diverters. So a few weeks later, we, he came for a continue, continuation of the treatment. You see the flow diverters are, dis, are, are separated from each other. You have this negative flow diversion. The, uh, the, the aneurysm is literally blown up. And we had to, to come back, recatheterize it, close the gap, close the uh, opposite uh, vertebral artery and uh, uh, sh shrink the aneurysm. Um, we use relatively strict, at least 30, if not 50 percent overlapping. So overlapping is a good is a good idea, and we always go from proximal to distal if this is technically possible. This is a, a girl. She was asymptom She was symptomatic from this uh, huge part of this aneurysm. She had um, temporal lobe seizures related, uh, at least sidewise, to the side where the aneurysm was located. And um, this is a good example why, at least with P64, it's a good idea to go from proximal to distal. Why this is the case, if you, if you see this here, the flared ends are widely open. So this was not intended to be like that. So the, the, we started more proximal, the uh, flutter water foreshortened, and all of a sudden we had this flared end in the artery. So we, again, we came back, started proximal, and again, uh, again went from proximal to distal. And this is the result two years later. Uh, shrinkage of the aneurysm, shrinkage at least of the uh, most important of the intracranial part of the aneurysm. And uh, the, the, the girl had no more seizures. Good. Uh, Megadol, ecolobic, uh, ectatic basal artery, the same message, telescoping from proximal to distal, 30 or 50 percent overlap, and uh, you have this is the immediate result, and this is the uh, follow up after two years. Um, we, if we want to have a more effect or a rapid effect, we combine usually two flo different flow diverters, mainly uh, pipeline and P64. This is another girl with the, uh, she's something like 16, with this dissecting M1 aneurysms, and this is a combination of P64 and pipeline, two P64, one pipeline, and you see the, the, they are fitting quite nicely along the artery. This is immediately after, and this is uh, the two month follow up, the, and uh, aneurysm state occluded, the uh, patient is asymptomatic. Sometimes really complex aneurysms need odd uh, strategies like a flow diverter in a normal artery. This is a, a, a baby. He had this dissecting aneurysms, aneurysm of the distal vertebral artery and the proximal uh, M1 and the aneurysm was also going to the uh, posterior communicating artery. So this uh, bifurcation of three vessels were affected. And you see here, this is the, the regular Cannot activate this. This is the re the uh, regular uh, P1, P2, and this is the PCOM, which is filling from the posterior circulation. So we started with the anterior part. We put flutter radius, uh, again, pipeline and uh, P64, reconstructed the anterior part of the aneurysm, and we were afraid to put another flutter radius from behind into the P1, uh, uh, the PCOM. Instead, we put a flutter radius from P1 to P2 into the normal artery. And you see here the redirection of the flow, uh, flow along the normal artery, not touching the aneurysmatic PCOM, um, uh, excluded the aneurysm from circulation. Uh, telescoping flutterverters need lifelong dual antiplatelets. This is a man from France. He came uh, to Germany for treatment. He had these aneurysms and had difficulty swallowing. This was the treatment. Uh, the course from 2010 to 2012, he was perfect in a perfect condition when he left. For any stupid reason, he decided by himself to stop clopidogrel. He was just on aspirin and died from basilar artery thrombosis. So they have to be on dual antiplatelets. Another situation, uh, a cavernous, uh, uh, um, a Pet Petrus aneurysm, large aneurysm. The lady was treated in, in 2012 and she was fine in 2017. And then a dentist decided that uh, for the tooth extraction, the pain afterwards to give her metamizole is a, a good thing. So she took metamizole and occluded her right artery, right ICA. Uh, just for the uh, antagonization of the aspirin effect from the metamizole. So long-term dual antiplatelet therapy is required. Um, coverage has been addressed. This is a, uh, a not a, a sagula, it's kind of diffuse aneurysm of the uh, basilar um, uh, bifurcation. This was growing and she had ruptured from another MC aneurysm. And the decision is 
what, what is the proper size? Slight oversizing in the posterior circulation is a good idea. It's all a matter of the angle between the struts. And you see here, this is a, a quite instructive table. This is, uh, the, the vessel diameter is 3.5 millimeters. So that you can see the, the decrease of coverage by increase of the device. If you use a 3.5 P64, you have a 37% coverage. If, it, if you use a four <coughs> millimeter, coverage goes down to 31%. And if you oversize, use a 4.5 millimeter P64 and a 3.5 millimeter uh, artery, you have a 24% coverage. This was the treated aneurysm. She unfortunately died from sepsis after valve replacement. Uh, what to do if you have your, uh, the flow diverter in the, in the wrong place? It, it can be very tricky. So how to, how to get rid of this? The most easiest way is, I mean, this was a silk. The silk was deployed in this fusiform aneurysm and all of a sudden the silk was foreshortening. How to get this, the silk out of there? You go there with a marathon and with a mirage, go through the struts to, to cathedralize the struts. is relatively easy. Once you have the wire through, you take a snare, you grab your wire and pull the whole thing out, which is here. You see here, this is the, the uh, mirage and the, uh, and the snare. The snare is used to grab the wire, a simple thing, and then you pull out the whole thing and take your flutter word out and get for a new one. Thank you very much. In time? <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Rankis? Double dual antiplatelets. Now, did you have a situation where the patient had to undergo surgery intracranial with dual antiplatelets already there or so is it anywhere in the body and what do you do then? You, you, do you stop? You don't stop? Yeah, it, it happens. I mean, of, co of course, I mean, many of these patients fortunately live, live quite long and have any, anything else. So uh, what works surprisingly well is uh, the combination. I mean, aspirin is, shouldn't be any, any issue. We, we have quite good experience by putting these patients on a combination of aspirin and, and direct oral anticoagulants. So we replace the second uh, antiplatelet, no more clopidogrel, no more ticagrelor. We combine mostly uh, aspirin and dabigatran. And you, if you stop for any surgery, it, it works for everything. If you stop the dabigatran the day before, on the next day you can do everything uh, with, without any hemorrhagic risk. It is, it's very nice to control it. And it's, I mean, it's, of course, it's, it's completely off-label. I just want to say thanks. You covered everything in a short while. What we wanted from you, we got it. <laughs> Vipul, can I ask him, uh, Hans, you went very fast and it was a really nice presentation, but you showed a very important thing is when the flow diverter is get screwed up, how to take it out. If you don't mind, just quickly going on the slide to explain for the audience here that because many of us get into that trouble and you said that in two seconds. I should repeat it? I don't know if, the, if, if it's okay with Vipul, because I think many people here, that's a very important point. How do you get a flow diverter out if you are in trouble? And particularly I mean, in India. I mean, for, for, fortunately, it's not so frequent. So, so, but if it is necessary to get it out, you go with a marathon or any catheter and the marathon wire, which is mostly not so difficult to get through the struts. You, you put a marathon, um, a mirage wire through the struts of your flow diverter, which is done here, this is the flow diverter. Can you have this the flow diverter. This is a, a, a marathon and mirage, and the mirage is is cathedralized through the struts of the flow diverter. Then you can take out your, your microcatheter to get more space for the second catheter and the snare. Then you come up with a rapid transit, for instance, and a two millimeter microvenous snare. And while it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to grab the flow diverter, it's, it's very easy to grab the wire and, and to take out the wire together with the flow diverter. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roberts.